Everyone, hi. Once again, Bruce Muffs and LCSW from Sunridge of Nevada coming at you with some more video breakdowns of songs that you really like and enjoy. we got a great one tonight for you. The song is Al, uh, Skinny Shug. That's the song off the album Alfredo, which came out by Freddie Gibbs and the Alchemist. And this album just recently dropped. He's at the top of his game. You all know him, and it's a great, great, great song. The reason why I like this song so much and uh, why we picked it was because I was able to relate to the lyrics in a very different way. It really spoke to me. It was very, very emotional. And it really helps me understand what people go through on a day-to-day -day basis and how people get caught up in that whole perspective. You know, so often, you know, doing clinical counseling and working with people, you got years ago, a lot of things are like op oh, what's called ODD, Oppositional Defiant Disorder, or Antisocial Disorder. Nonsense. What these young people were dealing with was PTSD, depression, trauma, severe anxiety over living in war zones where this kind of lifestyle was all too commonplace and it affects them on a different level. When it comes to trauma, there's nobody better than me because I've seen it, I've dealt with it. I've interviewed literally thousands of kids and young teenagers and young adults and even you know middle-aged people my age who just deal with this kind of stuff on a day-to-day -day basis and deal with the carnage and the violence and the self-destructiveness and how that lifestyle literally eats at you. So without further ado, here we get into it. It's Skinny Shug is the um, lyrics and here we're gonna break it down. What I do now when I break these things down is I'm gonna say the lines and I'm gonna break it down clinically. So here we go with the intro. Now I wanna say this also is that what I liked is, and I learned this you know, just actually even today, is that what Freddie Gibbs is, is known for as is the alchemist is sampling different sounds to get the mood and the intro going so it kind of like brings you in together. I don't think people really appreciate that sometimes is what these guys do to make the song work. Because the way I listen to the song, which is about for me 10 to 15 times, is they wanted to draw you into a world that is discordant, that is violent, that is aggressive. And the way they did that was using like a Spanish guitar sound, which is called uh, flamenco. And you get like one note at a time. It's really because they want to bring you into the scene. And the music's almost like saying like this, come on in, come on in. We're painting a picture. And they're doing it by being very sparse, very minimal. And I really admire these people that take a chance when they do these kind of creative things musically. So here goes the intro. Um, and to me... It's such an angry song that he's almost spitting out the lyrics, like the way he's just, you know, bam, 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 like spitting them out. He's so angry. And you're thinking about, you know, the payoff and how it's going to work together. So here it goes. The intro, Young Cocaine Dream, because you're thinking about the payoff and the money and all it's going to give you, you know, the temptation it's going to lead you into. And then, you know, next three lines. Go to sleep like, see the Grim Reaper, and the guy said, you know what I'm saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the dream turns into a nightmare. That's the problem. And what you really see there is the angel of death, the Grim Reaper. And you realize that the true price that you're paying and what it will really cost you, it's a true meeting with death. That's a great visualization. The Grim Reaper's right there. Yeah. Then you go into the verse. Like every night I dream, someone's trying to murder me. Visions of my loved ones dialing 911 emergency. It flows. It's very, very flowing. Here comes the real dreams. All right? They're not dreams. They're nightmares. All right? Because competition's everywhere. Yeah. I killed someone. Someone's trying to murder me because I murdered someone to get to where I'm at. No one forgets. Everyone's keeping score. The competition is ferocious. And what's going on? Your family is terrified. And round and round it goes. You know, 911, 911. Do you know where my son is? Unidentified. He's wearing a, a type of clothing, certain kind of hat, certain kind of sneakers. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I've had parents describe that to me, worrying sick about their kid. And waiting for that phone call to come. And how terrifying it is and how scary it is. Now, it goes like this. If he comes back and kills me, I know this blank was businessman. I never take it personally. Yeah, it's just business. 
It's business, man. I never take it personally. You say that. You know why you call it business? You got to stay detached and not make it personal. You understand how he makes it flow? It's business. It's not personal. You know what? It's not easy to do that. Whenever people say to me, you know what, Bruce? It's not personal. It's just business. It's about money. No, it's personal. You don't want to call it personal. They'll just make it, you know, you'll make a, a statement to get away from that perspective. Bruce, it's just business. It's not personal. No, it, it's personal. It's personal. That's why we're doing this. Then I skip a couple lines. It goes like this. These losses set me back, man. I'm literally selling dope to rap. How can someone cope with that? The answer is that you can't. And you have a hard time looking yourself in the mirror for what you got to do to make it work. You know, interesting again, um, <laughs> I was telling this to my producer. When I was lean, reading these lyrics over like the 10th, 15th time, listening to them in my ear, because what I'll do a lot of times is I listen to the music with my eyes closed. I want to just kind of hear the music enter my ears that way. On a certain way, I can relate because I know what he's trying to say here. You want to do your real love, but your real love costs a lot of money. And, you know, studio time, producer time, engineering time. Make, it, it's insane how much money goes into making even a, a, a lousy record or a lousy song. Imagine making a good one, how much effort and how much time you have to put into it. I know from working like a dog all day long, just to go ahead and do something like this, which I truly enjoy doing, the, the work that I have to do to make it financially for me to even come out here and make it work with my, you know, agent, producer. It's like I had, like, it was like eerie. Those two lines kind of hit home for me. So if I ever meet, have a chance to meet this, per, this guy in person, I'm going to say, you know what? You got a fan in me. And I'm really relating to what you put down there with those lines. Yeah, I'm literally selling dope to rap. How can someone cope with that? Yeah, you got to look yourself in the eye. What does it cost to get to the pinnacle to get to do what you really want to do? What's the sacrifice? And it's hard when you have to look yourself in the mirror and say that I make the right choices. Now, he goes, man, my uncle died of an overdose. And the blank part about it is that I know I supplied the person that sold it. Man, those two lines were like caustic, like battery acid when I read them. Because how do you live with yourself? The answer is you don't. Now, there was a listener in, you know, you know, reading, listening to, not reading, listening to the song. I like to listen to, the, not listen, I like to read the comments that people make. One person wrote this. He said he was crying, but it, was like, it wasn't my uncle that I had sold the drugs to. It was my best friend. That inadvertently overdosed over it. My hand, my best friend is dead. How do you go to someone's funeral and say to the parents, oh, by the way, the reason why your son is laying in a casket now is because of me. I sold him, you know, I sold him indirectly the drugs that he took to die. How do you look at yourself? You can't. So what happens next? What happens next? Put a pistol to my head. I was way too scared, drunk off emotions. I'm drinking and taking these drugs because I can't numb the pain with smoking. Yeah, we see this all the time. Suicidal, self-medication, self-medicating, drinking and drugging. You know, I'll say to somebody, you're feeling so depressed, you're so down. Why don't you get yourself on some medication that can help you? Anti-depressant, anti-anxiety. Why aren't you working out? Maybe do some supplements, something. They're like, man, I got my weed. That's become the that's become the end all be all thing now. I get this all the time, Bruce. I got weed, man. It's natural. It's medicinal, and that bud tender knows what he's talking about. How did, all right, you know. But I get that a lot, and the drinking is a way to you know to deny what you're dealing with. Drugs and alcohol go like peanut butter and jelly. They're a perfect combination because you don't have to think, you don't have to feel, for really minimal amounts of money. So I understand that. That's why people are so afraid of therapy. Like, wait, I got to be sober and dealing with reality to talk to somebody? No, 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 no. I don't want to go into the deep water. That's not fun. Let me stay in the shallow with my little life jacket on there, you know, get a sunburn. I'll get high. I'll get loaded. I don't want to talk about my feelings because that's too scary. All right. Then another great line. He goes, loner. But I hate to be lonely. Oh, man. Have we said this before over and over again? 
No man is an island. Guys, girls, who's ever listening to this one, you can talk all you want of being a tough guy, tough girl. I don't need nobody. I'm my own boss. It doesn't work that way. We all need somebody to care about us, to have a 911 call made on your behalf. Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? And a lot of times people don't understand that till it's way too late. But I get that really, really clearly. I hate what I've become, you know? I'm an island because I, I let anyone see what I'm really like. I'm going to have to embarrass myself by being emotional, by being real. Can't do that. I got my image to protect. You know what that image is? It's insecurity. It's fear. It's desperation. It's false bravado. It's like, it's like paper thin. It's not a real reputation. It's based on dominance, yelling, screaming violence, which is inevitably going to fail. So... Then he goes like this, his quote, quote, real friends that he thinks he has. You know, I had a girlfriend, she fell in love. Yeah. Uh, let me break this to people real quick. When you have sex with a woman, you're intimate with a girl, woman, whatever, it's, it's statistically women take that as you care about me. If I'm giving myself to you emotionally and intimately, there must be some kind of love. And for guys, it's like, you know, like too dumb to understand that. And they don't get that. He just wants to have, you know, you know, friends with benefits and she wants a ring, you know, and that's when you have the problems begin. But he's saying this and then, and if, but if I fall off or get locked up, she might just go with my homies, my so-called friends. So where was the relationship? She's going to keep someone else's bed warm if you get killed or locked up, there's no like, I'm going to wait for you. Right, 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 right. How many times have I had people tell me, I thought she was going to be faithful. And I came out, she's living with a different guy where it was like, who are you again? Slam the door in my face. That's what happens when you're out of circulation for a long enough time. They forget about you. And then he goes, most people die of love or having trust, trust in their homies. You know, but here's the thing. They're not your friends. It's not a real relationship. It's all made up of falseness. Yeah, I get to hear this all the time from people that were legitimate gangbangers. Bruce, I thought they were my friends. I thought they'd have my back. I thought they'd watch me when I was in prison, well, when I was locked up, and my girlfriend needed money for diapers for my kids. And then they weren't there. Then they weren't there. Then they abandoned me. Then they left me alone. Then they said, who are you again? You're not doing any work for us. We're, I need $2,000 to pay my lawyer. Okay, here's two hundred. dollars Where am I get the other 1800 Hey, man, get back to work. Get back to business. I'm already in trouble. I don't want to get into any more felonies. Like, what happened? What happened? What happened? What happened? You know, I always get this thing like, these are my, my blood brothers, my friends for life. Be a little more skeptical be a little bit more wary. That's all I'm saying about that one. Then, here's this one. My my baby's mom is a fiend, drug user. Shock again. Can't keep herself off the smack. Let me know that's slang for heroin. She called the police. Now he's doing seven years for a sack. He told me, look after his kids. And a week later, she turned up dead, whacked. Yeah, that's the lifestyle. Because legacy becomes one of death and destruction. And you literally pass, you know, you poison the next generation by your actions. You have a kid born with drugs in their system, which is a horrible thing to see. I've seen that a few times. It was horrible. They just scream for the first, like, six months. It's just crazy. Weeks, they'll scream because the drugs are not in their system and they're desperate for a fix. Because it goes through the placenta, you know, goes into the it goes into the child. Maybe off about the length of time, but it's it's for a while, for days. They will just scream, looking for drugs. Horrible to see. And you've killed everything. I've seen this over and over and over again. How one generation will manage to destroy beautifully the next generation before they even get a chance to fly. And I get the same comment from people, from those that are able to leave the gang, you know, in one piece. Hopefully, Bruce. I got out. I got out. Got out. Okay? And here's the last piece. He goes, it's just the code. Cause, and he goes, Lord, give me the strength to ignore the things I can't control. And he has the word in there, fear. Because you can't control your fear. That becomes part of your lifestyle. 
It's like every night you go out to sell, buy, hurt someone, distribute. There's a fear factor. Am I going to come back alive? You know, it's like a fighter going into the ring. There's a fear that you're going to be beaten badly enough to be humiliated by the other fighter where people watching. MMA, they all have to deal with that thing of the fear factor. You go into combat. Am I going to you know, hold myself up you know, my head high? Am I going to run screaming backwards and say, leave me alone and throw my gun away, throw my weapon away? It happens. I've seen people break at fear in counseling sessions, try and deal with people, and the fear is all over their face. So I understand that. Lord, give me the strength to ignore the things that I can't control. Your fear. You can hide about that all you want. But inside your heart, you're scared. Because you know any day in this game with this code could be your last. And there's no eraser to go back in time when you have three shots in you. So here's the last thing. He goes like this. The outro is this. And we do this also. That's what we tell ourselves. It's a code. It's a code. Code of honor. Code, 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 code. We tell ourselves this. You know why? We don't want to make it real. Because when we start mourning the losses and all the carnage and all the debt that we've caused, it's not a code anymore. It's a sickening lifestyle. That's not even a lifestyle. It's a death cycle. That's what happens. And that last thing with the outro, there's a line in here, you know, we kill them, one of them died, they had to get taken out. Then it goes like this, then they came back and then it's a few till they don't want no more. Here's the problem. What if they do want more and they want you? You got the next bullseye on your back. What if they do want more? You know, we always think we can control things like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We take out one of theirs and it's all good. They may not think like that. You know what they'll think? You know what? They took out one of ours. Let's take out two of theirs. And it goes on and on and on. Not to make it real. And, you know, it was interesting. I was just telling this to my producer. Just two quick stories. There was a Baron von Richthofen, the German World War I A. He said like, like 90 kills. And at the end of his life, a few days before, he wrote a memoir. And the last few pages, he talks about how death is becoming more and more realistic because the more you fly in combat, the more you're likely to get shot down. And he walked into the mess hall one night, and he was like the grand old man at 26. And everyone looking at him was 19 and 20, looking at him like a god. But all the people that he knew and flew with initially were all dead, twice over. And they're looking at him like he's... God of, of the skies, which he was, but he knew the more you fly, the more things can go wrong, the more likely you are to have the specter of death, the angel of death follow you. Our time comes, and when you put yourself in dangerous situations like this, like being in combat, the end is going to come. I want to clarify just say two, two quick points. At the end, the song, the music, the, the video, st- the lyrics stop, I'm sorry, the lyrics stop, but the music continues, and it's that flamenco way of talking. And it, like what it's saying is this, like, dun, 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 dun. Not, of course, I'm not doing justice to the, to the music, but it's tailing off with no conclusion. It's just like the next guns, next concrete cowboy is going to get killed. Just the next, just a matter of time, just a matter of time, just a matter of time. Now, and the thing is, he's a known sampler, um, Freddie Gibbs and the Alchemist. So it makes sense that they would go this route. I liked how they did it. I liked how they opened it. And I liked how they closed it. And I want to share just one last story to people that are listening to this, that will be listening to this. When I was working with kids, and I went to detention a lot, and sometimes I'd have to see kids that weren't even sex offenders, just kids in other kinds of trouble, other kinds of felonies. I would listen to them, talk to them, make recommendations to their parole probation officer, to their attorneys, to the judge. I said to like 99% of them, you don't have the heart for this. You think you do, but you don't. And I'm saying this to you as a compliment. You don't have the heart for this quote, quote, lifestyle, for this code. You're just a nice kid that made a really stupid mistake or mistakes. I'm here to tell you on the last face you're going to see before you're locked up for life. This is not your lifestyle. This is not your future. Go home. Stay in school. Connect with your parents where you're forced to parent. But you don't have what it takes to be successful in this business. 
You're not going to make it. You're going to be a casualty. You're not a wolf. You're one of the sheep. Not everyone listened to me, of course, but a few did. And years later, I would see them in the streets or somewhere in Vegas, and they'd say, thank you, my man. You were the only person to talk to me honestly and make it real for me. Thank you. I'm grateful. I'm happy for that. But I want everyone to realize the song is written beautifully and, the, and the, the music at the beginning, the music at the end kind of bring it all together. But the music is discordant. It's not like focused. It's like single notes to tell you it's not going to end till you're dead in the street or in the home and someone else is going to take your place. Think about what I'm saying. And for those of you that like to write in about making choices that you made some good choices, out of bad choices, let us know. I'm curious. Bruce Moffs in LCSW, Summer Ridge, Nevada. Thanks for listening and watching.